Okay, so what I'd like to talk about now, just to um, get going here, is um, we were talking last class about um, depth first search. I fell a little bit behind last class, so I want to finish going through some of the stuff on depth first search before I move on into minimum spanning trees. Um, and the, you know, we talked about, the app, about depth first search as being wh what was important about it was what? What is the real difference that makes depth first search different than breadth first search? It is how it organizes the edges in the graph. Does everybody get that idea? There is a tree of discovery and there are other edges. And what is the magic property of, of if, it's an under, if it's an undirected graph, what was the magic property of, of depth first search? Every edge was either a tree edge or a back edge. Does everybody remember that? So I want to try to illustrate why that principle is kind of important on, um, on one problem. I'm not going to quite go through the whole algorithm, but I think it's going to kind of show you why this organization can be helpful. Okay? And it has to do with a, an important problem on graphs that you should know about, which is finding an articulation vertex. An articulation vertex is a kind of weakest link in a graph. That's kind of the important point of it. It is the, a vertex whose deletion will disconnect the graph. Okay? And if we look at this particular um, thing, let's call it a road network or something, a road network or a phone network, which vertex is it? How many vertices are there on that graph whose deletion will disconnect the graph? There is one. And which one is it? I get to use this laser pointer, right? Um, if I don't blind myself. OK, good. This one, right? Does everybody agree with that? This one has the property that if I disconnect it, delete it, it will disconnect the graph, OK? Any questions about that? And so again, if you want it to disrupt the network, if you're a terrorist or something like that, this is the one you want to blow up. You blow up this, this one, the people who live there are going to be unhappy. You blow the thing up here, these people can't talk to the other people. Okay, that's what the principle of a weakest node in the graph is or an articulation node. Any questions? Can anyone give me an algorithm to find if to test if a particular node is a weakest no, is an articulation vertex? How would you tell if a particular node is an articulation vertex? Yes? The key idea is if I take a node and I delete, if I first test, is this graph connected? OK? Yes, it's connected. If I delete this node, is the, I now can I then test if the graph is connected. Does everybody see that? And the answer will be yes, there's one component. If I delete this vertex, there will be two components then, right? How much time does it take to test if a graph is connected? Yeah? n plus m, and why is it n plus m? Because I start a traversal, a, a BFS or a DFS, from one node in the graph. And I look to see how much do I find from it? How much can I reach? How much will I discover? If the tree of discovery hits every single node in the graph, then the graph is connected. If the tree of discovery does not hit every node in the graph, then the graph is disconnected. Does everybody get that? So it should be clear that I can find out, is there an articulation vertex in the graph? Yes. For i goes from 1 to n, delete the ith node, test if what's left is connected. If it is connected, then it was not an articulation node. Regardless, put that vertex back and delete somebody else. Does everybody see that doing n connectivity tests or n traversals is enough to test this? Any questions? Yes? Everything n plus n is going to be, n plus n is how I say linear time. Okay? It is linear time in the number of vertices and linear time in the number of edges. Now, usually in a connected graph, in a, in a connected graph, the number of edges is going to be at least n, m, n plus 1, right? So m is basically big O, uh, you know, proportional to n or bigger, right? So if you tell me it's a connected graph, then I could just say order m, right? 
and I wouldn't be saying, this, saying anything wrong. But generally, just to cover my butt, the convention is we say that n plus m, because if we have a graph with a lot of vertices and no edges, we still have to cruise down the adjacency lists, test that each one is empty. Yes? Why do you have O of n times n plus m? Why do I have O of n times? Because, because what did I do here? The algorithm of deleting and testing was what? Okay, I did each um, breadth first search, each connectivity test took n plus m time, right? If I'm doing n of them, how much time did the total algorithm take? n times n plus m. So I could say that, I could rewrite that as saying that's order n squared plus nm, okay? And if I have a graph with a lot of it, if I have an empty graph, which is the leading term here? A graph with no edges, a lot of vertices and no edges. This is the big one, right? And if I have one that has a large number of um, edges, okay, this is going to be the leading term. Does everybody see it? Because neither one of these always dominates the other one. I got to keep both of them around. That's kind of what the principle here is. Okay? Usually in interesting graphs, m dominates n. And so I could just basically talk about this. But at the very least, this is a reminder to me, n plus m, of how depth first search and breadth first search work. You are looking at every vertex and you are cruising down all the entries to every list, right? And so that's why I write it like that. Any questions? Any other questions about that? Okay? Any questions about what our articulation vertex is? Let me give you, in fact, there is a, a somewhat complicated, so I'm not going to go through the details of it, linear time algorithm to find all articulation vertices. So this is going to be n times faster than the other one, right? And how does it work? Okay, I'm just going to give you the idea here. Suppose we build the breadth first search, the depth first search tree of a graph. Actually, um, yes, yeah, suppose we build a depth first search tree of a graph. That's these tree edges, right? Actually, maybe I'll point, you know, you see what the tree is, right? If it's a breadth depth first search, every edge in the graph is going to be represented either as a tree edge or a back edge. Does everybody remember that? Now, if you take a look at it, where is the articulation vertex in this graph? Which del vertices deletion? Yeah? The one labeled x is. Now, why is x an articulation vertex? Does everybody see that if we blow up x, OK, what's going to fall down to the ground? This subtree. Does everybody see that? Right? And why is it going to fall down to the ground? It is because there is no back edge from these guys that goes up to a higher ancestor. Does everybody see that? OK, and this side, why is it that the other side isn't going to fall down? Because there is a back edge that goes to a higher ancestor. Does everybody see that? And because the depth first search has laid out the edges so nicely, the question, a, a vertex, you can now describe what is a vertex Essentially, a vertex is an articulation vertex. If there is a subtree of it that does not have an ancestor that goes to a higher level, OK? Any question about that? Do people see how the organization of the tree helps out in figuring this out? Any questions? I think of this as kind of like a James Bond thing, where you know James Bond is sitting on this edge and the bad guy's got, you know, over here, has a bomb ready to go off, you know. How's, how's he going to escape? Okay, he knows that when the bomb goes off, he's going to drop down, and that's the end of James Bond, right? What is he going to do? He, you, you've seen the movie. He takes a blowgun with a, uh, what, a, a, a spear gun with a rope tied to it, right? And Kachung, he shoots it up to an ancestor, okay? Because that's the way that when, when the thing blows up, and it will blow up, he will still be hanging on there. Any questions? Yes? Uh, 
If we what? Which one are we talking about? This one. Now this one, what is the story? This one is not an articulation vertex, but the root actually is, right? Does everybody see if we blow away the root, this guy falls down, right? So he's not, in this case, x is not the only articulation vertex in that graph. Does everybody see that? The root would also be. If the right subtree was deeper, If the right subtree was deeper and the node connected to x, notice that if we had a deeper subtree here and it connected to x, we didn't have a depth first search tree. Right? If there was a connection from somewhere down here up to x, it would have been discovered when we processed this vertex and not that one, right? And that whole thing would be hanging down. Okay? So the neat thing about depth first search is that it or is a tree and it organizes things so everything is either a tree edge or a back edge if it's an undirected graph. Any questions about that? Okay, and now you should start to see why that property is important. Okay, any questions or potentially useful? Okay, any questions? Yes? This gives, you, this gives you the technical details. This is a more detailed description of exactly what is the criteria for falling. So that means that the back edge could be inserted to the subtree but not to an aperture? Notice that in this case, what's weird about it is, in this case, this is a back tree. This, this, the X is a uh, articulation vertex for this subtree, but not for this subtree. Does everybody see it? So there's some, you have to be, be careful about what is, uh, you know, the details of exactly what is and is not is a little, diff, you know, a little bit, you know, a li little bit complicated. And so we, I don't want to go into that. But what should be clear that if everything is a, is a uh, tree edge or a back edge, then basically this gives you a reasonable way to talk about what is a, an articulation vertex in a way that, in fact, you can detect it basically, do a depth first search, Keep track of where the ancestors are going as you go down and go up, and you can pick each node and it can sink. Yes? Well, where else is there? There's some. Which else other ones are there? This one is. This one isn't, right? Does everybody agree that this one isn't? None of the leaves are. This is one. Is this an articulation vertex? If I delete this, the answer is yes, it was because this would fall. Does everybody agree with that? So the way that this kind of algorithm works, if you follow it carefully enough, and I think I give you the code in the book, but basically it's going to go, your depth first search goes bunk, 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 right? And it evaluates every node for whether it's an articulation vertex on the way back. Remember I said there's sometimes a process vertex going for at the beginning first time you see it and process the vertex at the end you see it? When you've looked back here and you have a descendant that has not had any ancestor taller than it, you know you are an articulation vertex. Okay? So that's kind of how it, the basic idea it captures. The main thing I want you to pick up here is just the intuition to see that in fact this strange property of of what is a, what will get disconnected if we delete it, has a natural interpretation in terms of tree edges and back edges. Okay, and if that's all we've got in the graph, then that's good. Yeah. Okay, so the particular order of the depth first search does not matter. That's an important point. You could do a depth first search from any vertex, you can break ties. Among who you're, you know, what, what the order of the edges are, it doesn't matter. You'll get a different depth first search tree. But the one thing we know is every depth first search tree of an undirected graph is going to have tree edges and back edges and no cross edges, right? And that's the property that this algorithm is relying on, okay? We may, we may discover which, is an, which articulation vertex, we, the order we discover them in may be different. 
But by the time we get back up to the top and have checked everybody out, it's going to be the same. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? Now, the question, uh, th there's another problem that is, well, that is neatly solved using um, depth first search. That is a topic on directed acyclic, directed graphs. That is a very, very important problem. Now, I've talked about, de top about uh, depth first search so far in the context of directed graphs. The world's a little more complicated with undirected graphs. Why is that? Can we have a forward edge? Let's say this is our graph, right? This is our depth first search tray. Can we have a forward edge in a directed graph? Directed, remember, meant that an edge from x to y doesn't mean that there's an edge from y to x, right? That's what directed meant, right? Is it possible to have a forward edge in a directed graph? The answer is yes. And why is that? Because in an undirected graph, when I had explored this vertex, if, if it was an undirected edge, I would have seen this edge and processed it first here, and it would have been interpreted as a back edge, right? If the edge only goes from x to y, and it doesn't copy in y's adjacency list, I won't see that one, right? I'll only see it when it comes here. Does everybody see that? So it should be clear that depth first search on directed graphs is a somewhat, somewhat different beast, OK? Because it can have these directed, these forward edges and these cross edges in certain controlled ways. Any questions about it? Yeah? Forward and cross, um, t to my way of thinking, forward and cross mean the same thing that they, for directed graphs that they meant with undirected graphs. OK? Any questions? OK? So that said, let me tell you about an important problem on directed graphs, the mother of all directed graph problems, OK? That um, has to do with something called topological sorting, which says that if I have a graph that is a directed acyclic graph, Directed means the edges are directed. Acyclic means that there is no cycle. There is no directed way to go bunk, 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 back to where you are. That's a cycle, right? Graphs, we said, many graphs are directed acyclic graphs. The example I gave before had to do with scheduling courses, right? Every course has some prerequisites, OK? Certain courses are prerequisites to other courses, right? And the question was, so long as that graph didn't have any cycles, we could have students graduate. But if we had a cycle in the order of prerequisites, no student could graduate because they couldn't take any one of the courses in that cycle, right? Because they didn't have the requirements for it. OK? Any questions about it? So directed acyclic graphs occur quite often in applications. And, um, the mother of all problems on them is this problem of topological sorting, which is constructing an ordering of the vertices so that all the edges go from left to right. OK? And this, I claim, is a, directed, is a topological sort of this graph. If you take a look at any one of the edges, let's just pick one at random, BC. BC goes from left to right now. Pick another one. There's one that goes DE. ED, no ED, it goes from left to right. Does everybody see that? OK. The topological ordering is a way to lay the vertices out in a line such that all the edges go in the same direction. Any questions? Now, can we find such an ordering if the graph contains a, direct, a directed cycle? No. Why is that? Let's say I have a directed cycle. I'm going to be going from. One vertex to another vertex to another vertex back here. I can lay A is going to have to be before B. B is going to have to be before C. C is going to have to be before D. But what is my problem? I need D also to be before A. Does everybody see that? And I can't do it without going backwards. OK? So this notion, it turns out this notion of does a graph have a topological sort? 
is exactly related to the question of does it have no directed cycles. Any questions about that? OK. Any questions? And like I say, whenever many graphs, if you have to deal with a graph, and it is by structure a DAG, topological sorting is the first thing you want to do. OK? And many scheduling problems fall into that category. For example, I'm going to ask the men in here a personal question. OK? Who here puts their pants on before their socks? Some people. Who put their socks on before their pants? OK? Now, does anybody put their pants on before they put on their underwear? <laughs> no. Why not? OK? It's because there are ordering constraints among clothing. Does everybody kind of get that idea? This is claimed to be a way that you can dress. What are the ordering constraints? You better put on your undershorts before you put on your shoes and before you put on your pants. Your socks have to be on before your shoes. OK? According to this thing, your shirt has to be on before you fasten your belt. Does everybody see that? The watch can go on any time. Does everybody get that idea? And a lot of scheduling problems basically reduce to doing a topological sort. If you wanted to figure out what, when, when they were designing your curriculum, how are we going to design the curriculum? We establish the prerequisites. And then we do a topological sort. And you're supposed to take the courses in that order. Does everybody see that? And some of that is sometimes unconstrained. Like there's certain courses you guys can take any time from freshman to senior, right, without any prerequisites. Other ones, there are long chains of prerequisites on. OK? Does everybody get the idea that when you have one of these scheduling problems, they often reduce to topological sorting? Any questions about that? So this has to be in your vocabulary of what you're looking to do. OK, if you have a topological, if you have a DAG, you want to topologically sort it. Any questions? OK, and again, the, you know, there, there are a lot of, this is the kind of thing that has a lot of application. To any, pretty much anything with a DAG, the first thing you want to do is topologically sort it. OK, I think in the interest of time, I won't talk about that example. But any questions? Yes? So if I want to do a topological sort, you said, uh, do I have to prove that the graph is acyclic? One of the neat things, I'm going to show you an algorithm to topologically sort a directed graph. And uh, it's going to go, eh, if it has a directed cycle in it. So, so the answer is, if, if, if it, it, will, you know, it, will, it will, in some sense, detect whether it has a cycle in the process of doing it, a directed cycle in the process of doing it. Any questions? Yeah. What, what? What is the order of complexity? The, the thing that makes it very nice is topological sort can be done in order n plus m. It can be done in the time it takes to do a depth first search. OK? So the marvelous thing about depth first search is that there's a lot of more powerful sounding problems that basically reduce to doing a depth first search. OK? And I want to explain that to you here. OK? But it's important you understand the idea of a topological sort and remember that. Because that's a, that is a useful, you know, useful subroutine to have in your head. OK? You see a DAG, you topologically sort it. Yes? If I say solve this problem on a directed acyclic graph, and your first step is to do a, a, a topological sort, at that point, a logical thing to say is, yes, you mentioned how to do this in n plus m time. It's sort of the same thing as regular sorting. And that's, you know, this is something I know how to do. OK? But I want to teach it so you guys know how to do it, too. Any questions? OK. So how can we do depth first search, OK, uh, topological sorting by depth first search? We agree, the interesting thing is that a graph is a DAG if and only if there is, if you do a depth first search on it, a directed graph, if you do a depth first search on it, and you have no back edges, OK? On an undirected graph, we saw that all you had were tree edges and back edges. If you have a DAG, the claim is that you won't have any back edges. Why is that? Well, remember the algorithm I gave you for finding a cycle in a graph? 
How did that work? Basically, there's three edges of discovery and there's a back edge. The moment you have a back edge, the tree of discovery in that back edge creates a cycle, right? So if you have any back edge in the course of doing your traversal, it is not going to be a dag. Does everybody see that? Any questions about that? Okay. But assuming we have a dag, the interesting property is this. If I label the vertices in the reverse order that they are marked completely processed, that is the topological sort. Okay? If you think about a depth, let's take a look at a depth first search tree. Okay, I guess, uh, do I have a dag here? Maybe not. Okay? But if we built a, um, a, uh, okay, let, 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 okay. The claim is that the algorithm, there's, there's two very simple algorithms for finding, doing topological sorting. The one that we're going to do here is just depth first search. We agree that as, as we go through a search, a vertex is, every vertex is going to go from an undiscovered state to a discovered state to a completely processed state, right? This is saying, put the or vertices, label the vertices in the reverse order in which they are completely processed. Does everybody see that? Let's think if that makes sense. If I have a depth first search where, if this was my tree, let's just not worry about the back, let's just worry about the tree edges. If this is my tree of discovery, okay, A, B, C, D, okay, which vertex of these would have been pro completely finished processing the first on a depth first search? Which vertex is the first one of these to get finished processing on a depth first search? Everybody see it's D? So what is this saying? The first one to get finished processing goes last. The, it's going in reverse order of them finishing processing. Does everybody see that? And does that make sense for the tree edges? Yes, because you want to be putting you after your parent, right? Your parent's got to be before you. Its parent has to be before it, and dot, dot, dot. Does everybody make sense? So in some sense, this idea of putting them in reverse order of finishing time should make some sense. Any questions about that? But we can prove it, OK? Let's think about what happens when we process each directed edge in the course of our search, OK? If we come across an edge, and it's going to an undiscovered vertex, what's going to happen? Then we're going to continue the depth first search here, and it's going to get finished. It's going to be completely processed before it bops back to here. Does everybody see that? So if an edge is, processes a undiscovered vertex, that's fine, right? What happens if we have an edge that goes to a vertex that was discovered but not completed yet. What does that mean? The ones that are discovered but not completed are going to be basically our ancestors on the search, right? And what does it mean if we have an edge that goes back to an ancestor? We have a cycle, it's not a dag, and that's when we say eh, right? Does everybody see that? If the edge is a back edge, then we say that you didn't give me a DAG, and this can't happen, right? The alternative is that I have an edge that goes, in this case, to a completed vertex. Does everybody see that? That's a forward edge. OK, this edge I could have processed. There's nothing else out of it. This one is completely processed. I could have edges that go back to a, um, what do you call it, a, uh, a previous, um, what do you call it? one of these, and the claim if I go to a completed vertex, then that means that, um, what you call it, this should be to the right of me, and that's exactly what it is, because the finishing time of this is going to be before the finishing time of that. Any questions about that? Do people see that the breakdown of the edges basically infers that if we process the edges in the order of, the vertices in the order of finishing time, we get a topological sort. Any questions? 
If you believe that, which I hope you do, this is the algorithm, the program to do topological sorting. What is it? What? All it is is, remember, we have take a regular depth, depth first search, and we instrument it with um, what you call it. Whenever we see a vertex, when we, we have a, the ability to process it late at the end of its, after we finished visiting it, then push that on a stack. And that's going to ensure that we, we, we do our topological sort in the reverse order of finishing time, right? And for each edge, we're going to figure out what kind of class it, edge class it is. Everything's fine so long as it's not a back edge. If it is a back edge, then that meant we had a cycle and we, we complained. Any questions? So the cool thing is that with depth first search, just as we defined, this is all that's needed to do topological sorting. Any questions about that? Yes? Forward edges can happen in directed graphs. This is a forward edge, right? A forward edge was one that went to an ancestor. That can happen in a directed graph. The breakdown of edges in directed graphs is a little bit more complicated. That's why I'm trying to sweep that detail aside, OK? But it should be clear that doing the, the search, to put them in the reverse order of how they finish in, in depth first search, does topological sorting. Any questions? There's another way to do topological sorting, though. Does anybody else know of another way to do it? I don't know if people have seen it in another class or anything like that. What do we know about the first vertex in topological, in, in topological order? What do we know about the vertex that's going to be first in topological order? OK, yeah? Does everybody agree that there's no edges that are pointing to it? It's in degree is 0. Does everybody see that? What could have been first, the first thing you do in the morning, if you look at our addressing graph? What has no prerequisites? You can put on your socks first. You can put on your undershorts first. You can put on your shirt first. You can put on your watch first. Does everybody see that? All of those, you have all that freedom in the morning. So do something different tomorrow if you want to get, live, live differently, right? But because they have in degree 0, does everybody see that? Now, suppose I have decided to put pants, for, no, no, no uh, shorts first. Um, actually, that's not. Let's say I've decided to do shirt first. Okay, if I now delete this, are there any other vertices now that are of in degree zero? Tie, right? Does everybody see? Now I am free to put tie on there. So what if we, we, we order the vertices by which ones have in degree zero? Then list them in order, delete them. When we delete them, when we delete the outgoing edges, we now see if we've deleted this edge, is this one now of in degree uh, zero, and then put that one next. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So if you do the bookkeeping, that's another efficient way to do it. OK? Any questions about that? So finding a topological sort turns out not to be very hard. OK? But it is fundamental to sort of under thinking about directed acyclic graphs. And the cool thing is, again, it shows that the power of depth for search, that because of how it organizes its edges, it gives you something powerful, essentially, for free. Any questions? Any questions about that? Any questions about undirected graph algorithms? Because we are now going to, uh, unweighted graph algorithms. Because we're now going to move on to something else. Any questions? Yes? In a depth first search on an undirected graph, everything is either a tree edge or a back edge. It's more complicated for directed graphs, right? And, and I told you that I always find graph algorithms terrifyingly complicated. Why are they terrifyingly complicated? Because there are these subtleties that you have to be careful about, right? OK? But basically, the principle is that the searches, the breadth first search and depth first search, organize the edges in particular ways that make that thing possible. Any questions? OK. So a lot of graph algorithms. If I ask you for a linear time graph algorithm, the answer is almost always do a depth first search or breadth first search traversal and do the right things 
as you walk over each vertex or edge. Does everybody see that? That's kind of what, if someone says, oh, I can do this at graph algorithm in linear time. How does he do it? You've got to be thinking, depth first search, breadth first search, something like that. Ah, now I see it. And, and the fact that the edges are organized this way, yes, now I see what makes it possible. Any questions? Yes? Okay, so what I think what okay, so what I think what you're saying here is okay. So if you look at my clothing thing, you said the watch didn't that if I deleted the watch, it didn't help anybody, right? So, but again, in topological in a graph, there can be lots of topological sorts. Does everybody get that idea? Can anybody draw me a gra a, a dag on n vertices, which has the most different topological sorts? Which graph on three vertices, on, on let's say four vertices, has the most different topological sorts? Yeah? Uh, this is it. A, B, C, D. Does everybody see that if there is no constraint, any order is possible? So if you have no edges, there's n factorial possible so topological sorts, right? And when you have multiple nodes of n degree zero, you can pick them in any combination, okay, in any order, okay, for them to be first, okay? Any questions about that? Yes? So, you mean first remove all of the vertices of D D0, you remove the first one, and then put them again? Turns out basically either way is fine. Fine, there always has to be a vertex of n degree zero. Why does there always have to be a vertex of n degree 0 if there is a DAG, yeah? OK, you could say it's, it's because there is, it's a cyclic. The other reason is because Skeena said that every DAG has a topological sort, right? And the first vertex in topological sort obviously has no back, n n n nothing into it, right? Does everybody agree? In a topological sort, the first vertex has no in degree, you know, has in degree zero, right? It must, or else it couldn't be first, right? And if you believe me that every DAG has a top, at least one topological sort, then that's a proof that, the proof that every graph has an, uh, a topological sort is the same as saying that there's got to be at least one vertex of in degree zero, okay? And they both relate to the fact that it's got no cycles. OK? Any questions? Yes? So in, in that graph, you're trying to draw a big vertex together. So uh, vertex, uh, uh, vertex 2, again, uh, vertex 2 is very out, out. OK, so the question is, if I, the interesting thing about depth first search is I didn't have to start my depth first search on a node of n degree 0. OK? This is worth thinking about. I'm not going to go through the details here. Nothing in that algorithm said anything about starting on my depth first search on a, on, a, on a vertex of degree zero, right? If I started it on any one of these nodes, unfortunately, I, I, I copied that out. But what's going to happen here? If this one, if we look at this, let's take a look at a DAG here. Let's look at a simple DAG here, right? Kabunk. Kabunk, kabunk, A, B, C. Does everybody see that? If I did my depth first search on the directed edge starting with from B, what would it look like? B would discover C. C would discover something else, right? nothing else, right? What would I then do? Well, remember how in the connected components, OK? We had to iterate through all vertices. Later on, I would start from vertex A. Does everybody see that? And from vertex A, it's going to go to vertex B and vertex C. Does everybody see that? Does everybody kind of get that idea? And so, in fact, I didn't have to start with a particular thing. But what was the finishing time? This was the first to finish. This was the second first to finish. This was the third to finish, right?
So this is why I say depth first search is fairly subtle on a directed graph. But notice that nothing I said about my depth first search algorithm demanded I start from a vertex of n degree zero. Yes? Does depth first search work if it's not a connected graph? If it's not a connected graph, you've got to do the same thing I did in my connectivity testing, which is make sure that I do explicitly try every vertex. Okay? I start from one, but I iterate through all vertices. Have you been discovered, discovered, discovered? Okay? And if you haven't been discovered, I start another search from there. So yes, that's an important part of this to make this work. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Oh, if you uh, start at D and you go down to C and you finish and you pop back up to D. Yes. Can, can you pop back up to A? Even though no, I can't. I'm I'm I, I'm on B. Now I'm C B. I'm looking around. You know, I there's people putting their ar fingers ar arms on my shoulders, but I can't reach back to them. Does everybody see that? So I can explore what's in front of me, but the guy that's got there, you know, in a conga line, they can't see me, right? I can't, I can't see them, right? I can't get back to them. And that's exactly what happens here. That's why if you want to explore everything in the conga line, you've got to do a search starting from every single vertex to be sure you're lucky to get the guy on the back, right? Who, in fact, can see ahead to everybody. Any questions? OK. Okay, good. Any, okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit, to, I wanted to talk today about, okay, view, let's say view, uh, full screen mode, bang, boom. Let's hope, is this right? Yes, zoom. Okay, so I wanted to talk, again, the problem of the day, we talk about it all, all you know, I, we talk about this in 30 seconds. You should recognize the problem of the day now as having to do with uh, topological sort. Does everybody get that idea? That if, again, if we had a world where I hate you and you hate somebody else and that somebody else hates me, there's no way to order us on a line such that we can't, you know, do violence to the guy ahead of us. Does everybody see that? Okay. And so it should be clear these are related to topological sort. And more than that, I don't really want to say because I'm a little bit behind. Any questions? Okay, good. What I'd like to transition now into, okay, for the last, let's say, half hour of class today, is um, weighted graph algorithms, okay? And um, if you had looked, you know, I, saw, I, I quietly, without mentioning, showed that my adjacency list structure, okay, what does no, uh, an edge in adjacency list structure look like? Because it's an adjacency list, it's going to point to other edges incident on vertex x. If there is an edge x, y, remember it is represented by y in the list of x. OK? If we want to represent a weighted graph where there is an, a, a number associated with each edge, that's basically all we do. We add a, a weight field to every edge record. And now we have a weighted graph. OK? Any questions? How can we represent a, a graph as a weighted, a weighted graph as an adjacency matrix? OK? How could we represent a weighted graph as an adjacency matrix? Yeah? Instead of a 1, you naturally put the weight, right? And you have some number that says, don't treat me as a weight, treat me as a not being connected sign. Right? Does everybody agree with that? But in general, by now, maybe you guys see that the, the magic in graph algorithms tends to be on the adjacency list side. Okay? That's where the clever algorithms usually can exist. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Good. Now, the most famous weighted graph, or let's say a, a very important um, problem on weighted graphs is the problem of finding minimum spanning trees. The minimum spanning tree of a graph, of a weighted graph, is a spanning tree, meaning a tree that connects all the vertices, whose edges sum to minimum weight. Okay? So if we say that every edge has a weight, we saw that a spanning tree of a graph is a set of edges that connect, that, that are a tree, that together connect all the vertices in the graph. The minimum spanning tree is the one that has the minimum weight over all possible spanning trees. Any questions about that? Okay. 
Now, we saw that a graph can have multiple topological sorts. Can a graph have multiple minimum spanning trees? OK. Let's think about it. Suppose every edge in the graph had weight 1. That was an unweighted graph, right? That was sort of what we've been dealing with. Does everybody agree that the breadth first search tree is not the same necessarily as the depth first search tree, right? So there can be multiple spanning trees of a graph, OK, if you want to be a little geeky about it. If you have a complete graph on n vertices, it turns out there's n to the n minus 2 vertices, different spanning trees you can form. OK? So you might have a lot of different minimum spanning trees if it's a dense graph with, un with no weights on it or the same weights on a, a lot of edges. But bottom line, we're going to be interested in finding a tree okay, that spans the, 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 all the vertices that it has minimum weight over all possibilities. Any questions? So here I have a uh, set of points in the plane, okay, A, okay. And um, what you call it? And you can imagine there being a graph on top of these ver points, a network, where the weight of each edge is the distance okay, between the two vertices. Does that kind of make sense? You can imagine there as being like a Euclidean weight, okay, where between every pair of these points, the distance between them is the weight of that e corresponding edge. For that point set, I show you two trees. Which one of these is the minimum spanning tree? Is it B or is it C? Who here votes B? Who here votes C? Okay. I hope to be seeing more Bs. Okay. This thing, if you look at it, every edge is going to be something like the radius of the circle, right? So you've got n radius edges that are radius size. Here you've got one edge of radius size. And if you've got enough points around the circle, the nearest neighbor of these is a lot smaller than that. Does everybody see that? The sum of the edge weights is, the, is minimum with uh, the one in B and not in A. Any uh, not in C. Any questions? Here is another picture of a graph I saw. The red, the, you can see the gray edges, OK? This is the minimum spanning tree of that particular graph, OK? Any questions about that, about what the minimum spanning tree is? Now, why do we care about the minimum spanning tree? OK? I remember once being encountered, you know, I walk, you know, again, occasionally in life people graduate, and I see students come, oh, some students run up to me from after they graduate. Oh, Skeena, Skeena, I took your algorithms class. I remember that. Prim's algorithm, Kruskal's algorithm. I said, what did they compute? Uh, why did you want to, um, you know, what, what did you care about the minimum spanning tree for? Uh, and they crawled away, OK? <laughs> so it's important to me that you know why you're doing these things, not just the names of the algorithms or something like that. Why is it that we care about minimum spanning trees? Because it's less obvious, frankly, than many of the other problems we will see in here, OK? One is that you, you have to believe me that um, it, it, it sort of rests. Th there are many problems on graphs related to this. So for example, suppose, let's say, you are a cable a company that wants to connect a bunch of houses together, OK, to give them cable television, OK? You guys, I suspect, are familiar with cable television, right? You can imagine a world where you have a new housing development. And these are the houses. And how should the cable company, here there's going to be a signal that's going into the, the, the satellite or whatever the ca main cable feed is, right? In order to get cable television to all these houses, you need to connect them. What is the cheapest way to connect these guys? OK? OK, we could have this house go connect to that house, and that go to there, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. But that obviously uses more wire than is necessary. Does everybody see that? We want the tree that connects all of these vertices with the minimum amount of wire. And that is, what is that called? Minimum spanning tree. Does everybody get that idea? So the same process should happen when you're building road networks. When you're building any kind of network, the cheapest structure there is a minimum spanning tree. Any questions about it? There's also a connection, which I think I'll talk about in here, but let's make sure of it. 
between clusters of things and minimum spanning trees. Suppose, let's say, we take a look at these points in the plane. Here I've got these points. How many clusters of points do I see here? I know how many I see. How many clusters of points do you see here? How many people see one? How many people see two? How many people see three? Okay. How would you teach a computer to find that there are three clusters of points here? One possibility is you build the minimum spanning tree. Does everybody agree the minimum spanning tree is going to look something like this? Is that right? And what are the clusters? The clusters are the minimum spanning tree, then delete the long edges, right? Does everybody see that? So there is a connection between minimum spanning tree and finding clusters of things that should be now fairly natural. Does that kind of make sense? Clustering is a big time problem. You should believe that people get paid to do clustering, right? And that you should see that now there's a connection between that and spanning trees. Any questions? OK, so I want you to be convinced it's an important thing and have that in your vocabulary of graphs. But there's two pedagogical reasons why we will talk about minimum spanning trees here. One is, it's got an amazing property, which I do hope, and I think I will be able to get to today, proving to you that the greedy algorithm works and gives you the correct answer. And this is kind of an amazing thing. It is actually an amazing thing that there are efficient algorithms for finding minimum spanning trees. There is not an efficient algorithm for the traveling salesman problem. There's not an efficient algorithm for many, many different um, optimization problems where you're always tempted to say, go and grab the next, make the grab the thing that looks best to me now, look best to me now, look best to me now. The interesting thing is that these algorithms, which are almost always are wrong, turn out to be right for minimum spanning tree. And it's interesting to see a proof to see why that is. So the greedy algorithm works for minimum spanning tree. That's one reason we're going to care about it. And the other is, what I won't get a chance to show you this time, but I will show you next time. To make minimum spanning tree algorithms run efficiently, you need to use clever data structures in an interesting way. Okay, and that's what I hope, I'll probably have to talk about it next time. Any questions? So this is why we care about minimum spanning tree, and I think I just said all of this, enough of this now, given where we are in time. Okay, so what I do want to talk about here is um, a algorithm which many, how many of you have seen Prim's algorithm before? Some of you, don't worry if you haven't. That, that, that's not, I'm not assuming that. Um, there's an algorithm for finding minimum spanning trees called Prim's algorithm, which is, um, works the following way, okay? It starts from one vertex and grows the tree one edge at a time, okay? And it grows it in a, in a, in a um, greedy way. Meaning that we're going to start from one vertex. If we want to grow a tree from that vertex of low weight, what would be the obvious next vertex to pick? Which one? Okay, the one that is closest to me, the lowest weight that is incident on me. Does everybody get that idea? And we're going to keep repeating this, always picking at every iteration the next edge, which has the property that it enlarges the tree at minimum cost of all possible ways of enlarging the tree. Any questions about that? Let me try to do this in an example way. And this is one where um, the risk of possibly life and limb. Let me try to do something here. OK. Is this going to work? Let me try something here and hope I don't get killed. OK, um, good. OK. OK, I hear crowds from the east. The crowd is worrying about this, OK? OK, let's put it this way. If I do get killed in this, the, the fat film of me talking about how I learned about life and what was important was, uh, would look very ironic on YouTube, right? Okay, does everybody see the graph here, right? 
Let us pick a vertex to start from. Which vertex does somebody want me to start from? Okay, just to be consistent, I guess I'll start with vertex A, so it's like the one in the graph, in the book. Does everybody see? Over here. Which is the ver edge here of lowest weight that is incident to me? What's the weight? Does everybody see that it's 5? Good. Now I've got these two vertices in my tray. What is the edge of lowest weight that is incident upon me? What is the lowest weight that I can get to? 7. Should I pick this 7 or that 7? Doesn't matter. Okay, I, I, I'll pick whatever one I... If, if it mattered, probably Prim's algorithm wouldn't be right. The interesting thing is it doesn't matter. Which one do you want me to take, the top one or the bottom? Okay, everybody said bottom, okay? <laughs> Good, okay? Now, what is the next one that is of lowest weight incident to this thing? Does everybody get that? Which is it? Three. Does everybody see that of the ones that are incident upon it, three is the one of lowest weight? Does everybody see that? What is the next one? What is the next one? Of all the ones that are of minimum uh, uh, incident connected to this tree, how can I add somebody else of minimum weight? How much is it going to cost me? Two. Two. I could add that one, right? What's the next one I can add of minimum weight? Two. Does everybody see that? And what's the next one I can add of minimum weight? Four. Does everybody see that? It should be clear that if I do this, I get a spanning tree. Does everybody see this? Why do I know I'm getting a spanning tree? Because I'm always trying to connect another vertex, right, that wasn't already. If I was connecting to a, a, a vertex the second way, that would create a cycle, right? But I'm always adding another. There's a tree of discovery I'm creating, right? And just like with depth first search, that meant there was a cycle, no cycle. Okay, any questions about that? Everyone should believe now that this procedure gives me a tree. Everyone should believe that this tree should be kind of low weight, right? Because I was trying to take low weight edges, right? But nobody should yet believe, except for the fact that it's true, that in fact this is the lowest weight of any possible spanning tree on that graph, okay? Making that claim is going to require a proof, okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about what Prim's algorithm is? Does everybody get the idea? At each point, I'm going to discover, add the next vertex that, uh, that, that is of lowest weight, the lowest cost way for me to enlarge my tree. Any question about that? Yes? What are the weights? The weights are whatever you want in your application. In our case of the cable company connecting, um, what you call it, connecting between houses, what would be the cost, the weight, logically, for the cable company on that example? Right? Remember we had a world where there were houses, and the cable company wanted to find a way to connect all the houses for cable television, so as to minimize wire, what would be the weight of this edge, the natural weight of this edge? It would be the distance between the houses, right? Or the distance between the houses, plus, you know, the, the cost of actually putting a wire in the ground between these two houses, right? Maybe there's a barking dog here that's going to be a pain to interrupt, right? So maybe it'll be more expensive than just the distance. But it would be a measure of the cost of connecting this to that. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. Let's get back to Prim's algorithm now. Why is Prim's algorithm always going to give us the minimum spanning tree? Does everybody see the algorithm? Basically, start from an arbitrary vertex. While there is not a, still a tree, the vertex is not in the tree, add the minimum weight edge between the tree and a non-tree vertex. Okay, and then add that edge and vertex to the tree and keep going until it stops. It should be clear, it's, it's got to be clear, this is a spanning tree. But is this really minimum weight over all possible spanning trees? Okay, any questions? How can we prove this? Kachung, here is our proof, okay? And I want people to try to listen and get this, because it's a, a 
Classic example of a proof by contradiction. Remember, computer scientists can prove things two ways, by induction and contradiction. And when we get to things like um, dynamic programming, we'll start to see some more induction stuff, so don't worry about it. That is important. But how does a proof by contradiction go? You're telling me Prim's algorithm is not correct. What does it mean if Prim's algorithm is not correct? If Prim's algorithm is not correct, then there must be a graph where it doesn't produce the minimum spanning tree. Does everybody see it? That's exactly what it means to not be correct. And I'll say, OK. So show me that graph G where uh, you tell me Prim's algorithm isn't doing it right. OK? And I'll say, well, if it's doing it wrong, Prim's algorithm is adding edges to, the, to uh, one by one, right? And at one point, if, if, if in fact it doesn't produce, Prim's algorithm doesn't produce a minimum spanning tree, at one point it will make a fatal error, adding an edge to, to the edges we already have, such that there is no possible minimum spanning tree that includes what we have so far. Right? If the tree, if the Prim's algorithm is wrong, there is a place where on this graph it has gone wrong, and you can hear in the bell, uh, here's the mistake. Right? Any questions? So let's take a look at that. So Prim's algorithm is merrily going along. Ka-chung, 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 ka-chung. Eh. What does that mean? On your graph, up till here, everything was fine. There is a minimum spanning tree that includes these edges. But Prim added that one, and this is where you made the fatal mistake. Right? So I'm going to say, is that so? OK. Well, let's continue on, finish up the minimum spanning tree with this stuff that we already have in it here. OK. Without this edge, there's a way to finish this into a minimum spanning tree. If there is, if I now add that edge back, what's going to happen? Does everybody agree that if I have a tree and add an edge to it, what do I create? A cycle. Does everybody see this thing? If you draw any tree, OK? You know, ka-chung, 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 ka-chung. Adding any edge is going to create a cycle. Does everybody see that? Now, what do I know? This cycle. Because I added this, um, this edge here, is going to have to pass through some of the tree that was OK. It's going to be other stuff that you built, and eventually have to get back into the stuff that you built. Does everybody kind of see that? So you're telling me, yeah, you got it wrong. This and this is the minimum spanning tree. And I'm going to say, is that so? Now I got you. OK? What do I know about this edge? This edge is the edge that, from my cycle, connected me back into the, my, into the fringe that I cared about. What do I know about the weight of this edge? OK. Prim's algorithm shows this edge instead of that edge. Does everybody agree? Prim's algorithm had the chance to take this edge and enlarge it and pick it, right? Why did Prim's algorithm pick this edge over that edge? Because it's weighed less. Does everybody agree with that? So what happens if I take this cycle, add, which I did by adding my edge, and deleting that edge? Does everybody see that if I have an, a, a, a cycle, if I delete any edge from the cycle, it's still going to be connected. Does everybody see that? So if I take your tree and I add this edge and remove this edge, it's still going to be connected. Does everybody see it? It is still a spanning tree. But the weight of this okay, cannot be larger than your weight, right? If this edge was shorter than this, OK, then the weight of the tree has gone down by that transformation. Does everybody see that? What if the weight of this was the same as the weight of that? 
then the, minimum, the weight of my tree is not different than the weight of your tree. But remember, you went, eh, when I picked this edge, right? You said this couldn't lead to a minimum spanning tree. But I've just proven that this leads to a, minimum, a tree that is as cheap or cheaper than what you said was the minimum spanning tree. And therefore, there's a contradiction, okay? My algorithm did not do wrong on this, okay? And therefore, my algorithm is correct. Any, how many people sort of see it? Any questions about that? Yes? Okay, the way to join two minimum spanning trees, I'm not joining two minimum spanning trees with Prim's algorithm. All Prim's algorithm is doing is adding one edge at a time. It's connecting another vertex into my spanning tree with every iteration. At the end, it's going to produce a minimum spanning tree. There might be other minimum spanning trees, but this is going to produce one of them. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? The, 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 the thing on, okay, right, so the, 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 the thing on the left is what I built from a uh, from Prim's algorithm that is, you agree, part of the minimum spanning tree, okay? The um, thing on the right, this thing, are the other edges of the minimum spanning tree that you say exists here that didn't include my edge. Okay, you're telling me that this is a minimum spanning tree and anything I built from this and this edge cannot be part of a minimum spanning tree. And I'm saying, oh yeah, let me show you how it is part of a minimum spanning tree. And therefore, there could not have been an edge where I messed up here. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Any questions here? Okay, so this is the proof by contradiction. Again, to look at the second slide, if you see the punchline. Okay, if the edge is not in the minimum spanning tree, there must be a path from x to, to y. Okay, all told, because of the uh, uh, because because the fact that you know in a minimum spanning tree it was connected. Adding the edge is going to create a cycle. Okay. But then if I find the edge, the first edge that I would have picked after what I had done, okay, there's got to be at least one of those, okay? And that one is going to be bigger, and swapping them out will lead to a tree that is no bigger than that. Any questions about that? That this works is kind of an amazing thing, because again, in life, you'll find that fast algorithms for these optimization problems very rarely exist. We'll see this when we look at NP completeness at the end. And this is one of those cases where the greedy algorithm does what we want it to do. Any questions about that? Okay. I've still got a few minutes, and I'd like to see any questions about subtlety here before we get into, uh, what you call it, before we get into um, the, the algorithmic part last time. Any other questions here? Okay, let me show you one other use of a minimum spanning tree then. If you really tell me, yes, I understand that, look at that proof and make sure you understand it for next time. Let me show you one other cute application of a minimum spanning tree. Um, we talked the first day of class about the traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem asked us to find an ordering of, um, all, the, uh, of all the vertices such that we could walk between one vertex and another, okay, at minimum total cost. Does everybody see that? And that was, we said, a hard problem. There's no fast algorithm to find the shortest order to visit a bunch of cities and get back home, okay? But what's interesting is the minimum spanning tree and depth first search together can give us a traveling salesman tour that is not more than twice the cost of uh, the optimum tour, assuming we've got something like points in the plane where the triangle inequality is observed. What is the idea of this algorithm? First, find the minimum spanning tree. Does everybody see that? 
And then let's do depth first search on the minimum spanning tree. What it happens when we do depth first search on a minimum spanning tree? We pick a root arbitrarily. What's the order of the search going to be? Bunk, 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 bunk. Does everybody see that? And does everybody agree that there's a bunk down and a bunk up? Yes. Is there an edge missing? Where do you think there's an edge missing? Okay, so again, it, this didn't show up as well as I would have liked it to show up. Let's say the answer is there's no, no edge missing. It's just, let's say, your eyes. I may be wrong. Look, look at it more closely when you see it, okay? But does everybody see the idea that still, if we go back and take a look at a tree and we do the bunk, 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 that first search on any tree walks down every edge and walks up every edge. Does everybody see it? Okay. Now... If we have a traveling salesman tour, okay, and we delete an edge, we get a, does everybody see, what do we get when we have a traveling salesman tour and delete an edge? Does everybody see we get a path like this? Does everybody see that that is in fact a spanning tree of the graph, right? It's a special spanning tree, right, where every node is of degree two, right? So the weight of this thing is going to be, is it bigger than this minimum spanning tree or smaller than this minimum spanning tree? It's got to be at least as big as the minimum spanning tree. Does everybody see that? Now let's think about our walking pattern. Remember we were doing the bunk, 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 bunk. Does everybody see that we are walking up and down every edge of this spanning tree twice, right? The total amount of walking I'm doing on this tree is at most twice the, is exactly twice the length of the spanning tree, right? Does everybody agree with that? And these other lines that you can't see. If I want to go from bunk, bunk to this node, I could go through the root. Does everybody see that if I took a direct shortcut, the length of going from here to there is going to have to be less than that, right? So what does this mean? Do a depth first search tree of the order of the minimum space.